I'm going to talk about two different things that I've done, which are not particularly related, although they're both in some way simulations. And um, the first is for teaching about electric circuits and particularly electronics. And the problem here is that mechanical systems, you can set one up and demonstrate it, and people can watch what happens. But even if you bring in a circuit and set it up in front of the class and turn it on, there's nothing to watch happening. <laughs> um, unless something goes really wrong and smoke starts to come out. <laughs> so what I wanted to do is have animations of it. And there's some nice mechanical animations. There's a, a system called interactive physics that, that is very easy to set up, very compelling animations of mechanical stuff going on. Um, but, but the purpose is really different. It's to make something invisible visible. So it's really, it's not a quick substitute for a lab. It's to go beyond what's possible in the lab. So if we're going to do this, we have to decide what voltage, for example, looks like if we're going to show it. And it actually turns out that everybody agrees that the right analogy to explain voltage is vertical position. Lots of different people who have done animations use vertical position in some way. Um, and it's also standard for, for probably a century. People have laid out schematic diagrams of circuits that way. It also has a physical analogy of gravitational potential energy corresponding to voltage. So here's an example of a circuit drawn as a conventional schematic. And what we do is, is lay it out in this three-dimensional view where we're going to have the third axis be voltage. And right now it's off, so there isn't any voltage. And then we turn on the voltage, and then you can see how that voltage distributes dropping across different resistors in the circuit. You can see that these two resistors in parallel have the same voltage drop across them. Um, and then we get to a more challenging problem of how do, we, how do we draw current on here? And, and there, nobody agrees. There are lots of different things that people have done of moving dots, the thickness of an arrow, wire thickness, a little meter sitting over on the side next to the circuit. But then that doesn't show you what's happening in the circuit. It, it shows you what you would do in the lab. Um, so, and other people just ignore it, but <laughs> what we did was to use arrows and to make the length of that arrow, as well as the, the, the um, thickness of the line, correspond to the current. So we just add arrows on there. And here's a, a bigger view of that. And now you can see things like you can see that this arrow length plus that arrow length maybe approximately add up to that arrow length. So you can see Kirchhoff's current law in operation there. So it's, it gives you semi-quantitative information. If you just saw an animation of moving dots or something, it would be harder to estimate magnitudes. So this I, I build up using a MATLAB toolbox that I created so that rather than drawing each animation anew, I, I have a set of tools of, of something that draws a function that draws a resistor, a function that draws a voltage source, and so on. And then I specify the elements. I specify exactly what the circuit does. It doesn't have physics of a circuit built in. I have to do the solution on paper or with something else and tell it what's going to happen. And then the students view the animations um, in class, on the web, or they can also run them in MATLAB themselves. So I want to quickly show you those. And with luck, that button will pull up a website with those animations on it. Um, and uh, so here are a bunch of, of power circuits. And these are GIF animations. And it's a little glitchy there as it's loading, but now it's fully loaded. Now well, mostly fully loaded, and it should now run smoothly. These are very quick to load. I, I did this back in the days of, of a lot of people, including myself, having dial-up. So I wanted very compact files and could, could generate these that way. It's also possible to convert them to a, a QuickTime movie. And that's the direction I'm moving towards because um, 
What that gives is it gives a pause button here. So if I want to say what's happening at that moment, I can, I can pause it and see that. I can also use the scroll bar to move through and, and move backwards and stuff and, and see different pieces of that. Um, and then the, whoops, I want to go back to this. Um, no, actually, I should, OK. So there's the other option is to do it without the website of just load the QuickTime directly. And uh, hopefully that is in process. Um, and just show that directly here. And again, you have the, the pause button and the ability to scroll through this. And, and I'll also show you the, the interface in MATLAB. So um, I could do, I think that's one that I can, no, I need some parameters on that. Oh, now that's working. OK, so there's that same thing in MATLAB. And now I can, I can uh, pull up a camera toolbar, and I can now orbit the view. Um, and I uh, look at this from different angles and maybe get a better understanding or maybe just confuse everyone by <laughs> turning that around. Um, and students really like this. Um, those are, that's one comment that really helped me understand what was going on. Um, I asked students about 15 different elements of, of this systems class, which looks at a lot of different kinds of systems. And this was the highest rated element there. Of course, that was the first year that I did this. And I was really excited about it. And I probably just transferred that enthusiasm to the students. If I'd surveyed them later, it probably wouldn't have, wouldn't have come out on top anymore. Um, and I've used it in, in other electronics courses as well. This is their ratings of the effectiveness of, at, of this element at helping them learn. Um, and uh, these are some of the the benefits I see in it. Um, if you want to play with it, the whole MATLAB set is up on a website, so you can download that and make your own. Um, and there are instructions there for how to make these very compact files for putting on the web, although if you really want to do that, let me know, and I'll have some better instructions for you than what's up there. Um, and I would love to see more people making new circuits and um, expanding what we have with this. So now I want to move quickly on to the other thing that I've done. And then if there's time for, for questions, we'll take questions about both of them. Um, this was a, a simulation of magnetic hysteresis done with a physical system in class, but using clickers for students to um, collect data and and combine that data in a computer that, that's collecting the data from their clickers and plot the results. So ferromagnetism involves nonlinear coupling between atoms, quantum mechanical coupling. And that nonlinearity leads to complex behavior, such as formation of domains and hysteresis. And so I didn't want a system that quantitatively obeyed exactly the same behavior, but had qualitatively the same kinds of phenomena and exhibited the same kinds of behavior. And so the, the system that does that is this array of compasses, 64 compasses that we got for, I think, less than a dollar each. And lay it out on a board there that can be set up in a hexagonal or, or a square array. And the, the nonlinearity is that the the interaction, of course, these compasses respond to the global magnetic field. But also, when these tips get close to each other, there's a very strong coupling of the, of the interaction between those tips locally. So there, there's two different phenomena, just like there are in, um, in, in real ferromagnetic materials. And one of the things that this does is it forms magnetic domains. So if we look at that picture more closely, we can see that there are two different regions. There's that region, and then there's that region, which actually goes around most of it in this. Someone just randomly took this picture, and it happened to be in this domain formation. So all of these, they're all lined up together with the red end this way and the white end that way. 
And then the blue section, they're lined up vertically. And then there are a few here that are not clearly part of one or the other, but those are just on the edge. Um, but then what we really want to do is, is see the hysteresis behavior of this. So we set this up with two Helmholtz coils around it and then connect those to power supplies and scan through different applied field values. And at each data point, at, at each field value, we have the students collect data on where these are all pointed. So if I had a class of 64 students, each student could keep track of one compass. I had a smaller class, so each student kept track of one column. And they added up how many are pointed what direction in each column. And then they used their clickers to send that data to the computer. And then we could scan on to the next. And I had a little video camera sitting up above this so the whole thing could be projected so everyone could see it without having to crowd around it. Um, and I didn't set up an automatic way to take that data and produce a plot with no human intervention. I had a TA sitting there crunching the data to take the, the output of the, of the clicker system and put it into Excel and generate this plot of the actual hysteresis loop of this. So um, similar kind of behavior. So um, I wanted to rush through that because I know we're, we're short on time, but now I'd be interested in your comments and questions on any of this. For, for the animations, is there any way that you think the students could, could do the after the math lab? Are there simpler tools you think that they put a lot of students to, to offer the animation? Well, it, it would be great to do that. And um, it, it's, not, it's not that far out of reach to make something like that. Um, well, the students certainly could do it now, but it's, it's just a little obscure. It's, you know, it's, it's text-based input rather than drag and drop. Um, so uh, it's, it's easy to imagine interfacing it with a circuit simulator and automatically generating the right behavior once the circuit is input. It's a little harder to get to the point of, of having an easy way to build the circuit in the first place. You could hope that you'd input the circuit into a circuit simulator that already has the nice interface for building the circuit and then feed that into here. But then I, I do that on a strict grid um, of, of all these connections are laid out um, on, a, on an equally spaced grid here. And so if somebody does that preform, then trying to fit it in that. So, but it certainly could be done. Yeah? Just wanted to, to give kudos to your kind of alternate way of using the clickers. I think we often think of the clickers being limited to kind of a multiple choice response uh, device. Um, and so I, I really like the way that you used it as a way of actually collecting uh, different kinds of, of data values. Uh, that's uh, very good. Thank you. Thanks. How was student feedback for that use of clickers? Was that a particularly successful animated lab, or how did they take to it? Um, I, I think they took to it pretty well. It was um, it was a class that I. I did that two years. One year I actually did it without the clickers and just had them writing down their, their numbers on a piece of paper and still had a TA who then had a lot more to work to do typing them in. Second year I did it with the clickers. I think it went more smoothly with the clickers. Um, and then I was rotated out of teaching that class. So I, I haven't had that much experience with it. Um, but I, you know, I certainly think that that, I don't know of any other good experiments that it could be used for, but there must be other experiments where you could have students observing different pieces of something. And right, and that kind data. of collective data gathering. Other questions? Well, thank you, Charlie. <laughs>